I, I am doing uh, well. Um, so the question on everyone's mind is, are you going to host this show? Uh, 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 <laughs> are you gonna uh, Are you gonna permanently host this show? Oh uh, no, I won't. No, I prefer you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, if uh, uh, what did the LBJ say? If uh, elected, I will not. If uh, what is it? If nominated, I will not run. If elected, I will not serve. Well, you I like Shad, man. What about What about uh, entertainment in Canada? Period. What about it? <laughs> Would you ever? Do you want to work up here? <laughs> yeah, do you no, hate I'd working work up, up here? here. What do you think of the well, entertainment industry? When I was industry? starting, and and I, I started a long time ago. I'm an old man, you know, fifty, two score and ten, as Abraham Lincoln would say. <laughs> I'm uh, so you know. Let's face it. I've seen more <laughs> sunsets than I'm going to see. But when I started out in stand up, um, there was no uh, Canadian TV. You know, there okay. wasn't nothing. Or movies or nothing like that. So we did our stand-up, and then we would travel around. And uh, thanks to this uh, very uh, nice man named Mark Breslin, who started uh, Yuck Yucks, we got a chance to do stand-up. And, uh, but there was nothing that we were going for. There was only getting better at stand-up. When I moved to Los Angeles, I started noticing. The first thing I noticed was, God damn, everybody's handsome. <laughs> like all the stand-ups were super handsome guys, which uh, is not the case here, or it was not the case when I was here. And so I was like, that's weird. And then I realized they were only using stand-up as a springboard to other things, which uh, I don't like. I just like stand-up for its own sake. Was it the performance side you liked first or the writing? Writing. I liked just to write. Like even later, like I thought... Um, man, I should be doing something on stage because I would write the jokes and I would just stand like a statue on stage. I move a little bit now, but I, I, literally, I'd be first of all, I'd be frozen with fear, but also I would never, it never occur to me to, if I was talking about uh, rocking a baby, to uh, pretend to rock a baby with my hands. I thought, I just said it. <laughs> so I could have really uh, just uh, uh, put a bunch of papers on a stool uh, in front of everyone and let them peruse it. How did you get better at that? I never got better. I, I'm, I'm a little bit better at um, physicalizing uh, my act, a little bit, but uh, I'm still, it's still mostly words. It's the imagination. You know, the mind, when I was young, we had radio, and in many ways it was better. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but you know how they say that old men they're like we would listen to the radio and it was better because your imagination is better than your you know especially hardcore pornography and you go what you know it's a weird thing though seriously yeah they go like about I'm just speaking of pornography because nowadays it's so awful but in the old days in the old days, all you had to see is a, a, a fleeting glimpse of a lady's ankle, and that would be enough. But you think about that, that's gross. Like, that's a guy's at home doing gross stuff to himself, thinking about a lady's ankle? God, damn, that's kind of odd, too. <laughs> and, and so are, do you think radio is better as far as the imagination just generally I speaking like radio that comedy theme. which doesn't exist anymore but uh, uh, I was thinking of doing a, you know that podcast radio podcast stuff I was thinking of doing an old timey radio thing because there are radio jokes that can't be done on television I, I can't think about but you know it'd be like uh, um, and, and, and it doesn't help any that you're wearing a, a, you know a pink chiffon it's something you don't see, yeah, yeah. but works after the joke uh, that you just heard. You know, informs the joke uh, afterwards. Uh, I don't know a lot of words, Shad, <laughs> and I'm trying to fit them in properly. <laughs> okay, I, I want to stick on the topic of Canada for a second since we yeah. have you here on our public broadcaster. Yeah. Um, you've said that as a young man, going on the train across Canada was one of your favorite yeah, things. I love that. Yeah. What was it about that that you loved? I'm going to do that again, I think. It was, uh, you get, well, you see the country. The train is the most beautiful, you know, um, all through literature, the train has, well, actually, it symbolized death. That's not a good one. But uh, 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 when you go on a train across Canada, you start uh, Moncton and you go across. Yeah. Uh, the first couple of days, people are normal. After that, people go crazy, start having sex with each other. Not me, but I saw it. And then a guy gave me a cookie. 
I was only 16, right? He gave you a cookie. Is that yeah, like a, a signal cookie. or what is yeah, that? Yeah, like a, one of those cookies that's laced with the uh, oh, okay. uh, drugs. But I was only a kid. I was only 15, 16. So the guy sitting right beside me is like, hey, you want one of these cookies? I go, no, man, I don't want no cookie. He's like, these are good cookies. I'm like, I don't, give, I don't care. I don't want no cookie. He's like, I'm telling you, this is a good cookie. I'm like, enough with the cookies. So anyways, whatever. The guy finally started to stop yapping about his cookies, you know. And then I woke up like a, a day later or whatever, and nobody was around, and I was hungry, and there was the bag of cookies. I ate the whole bag. Oh, no. Yeah, it didn't turn out well. And then I remember there was a little elderly black gentleman that was a porter who uh, I, uh, I uh, said really filthy things to, like uh, I, 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 almost like I was coming on to him. As a teenager? Yeah. I was, because of the cookies. Because of the cookies, I figured I'd have my sexual awakening with a 78-year-old uh, man. <laughs> but you went back onto the train, though. Yeah, that... I've been on the train three three or four times. So that didn't day. scare you off? No. The train across Canada, if anybody has a chance to do it, is is the most beautiful experience. You know, you go through Kicking Horse Pass and stuff, and you, you go in the bar car, and you meet strangers, and you look out the window, you know, and there's a lady putting up her, uh, you know, her wash on her line with her clothespins. It's very romantic, right? Yeah. You imagine your life in any of these little cities and what it would yeah. maybe look like. Right? Yeah, and she, the lady with the clothespins, imagines your life. Yeah. Uh, and you brought up Moncton. That's where the train line starts. Yes, sir. And you tweeted a really great story about your friend Phil. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, in Moncton. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell us about that? Uh, well, uh, there was some uh, unpleasantness in Moncton uh, a year ago or so. The, the uh, shooting. With the shooting, yeah, uh, which is something that happens in our times. That didn't happen when I was a boy. But, uh, yeah, I, I knew an old man there who, uh, who my friend uh, Shaggy, <laughs> that wasn't his real name, but he sounded like the dude from Scooby-Doo. And uh, so we all laughed about that because we did uh, Count Chocula and uh, smoke uh, marijuana. And uh, uh, so he said, I was going to Moncton. I just started taking the train. And I said, I get some work. He said, oh, yeah, my old man's there, you know, Phil. And uh, so anyways, uh, uh, when this unpleasantness happened in Moncton, um, it was the, it was the, it was the, um, the, the Kings were in the finals, you know, yeah. <clears throat> Los Angeles. And I was there and I had a ticket. And uh, instead of going to the game, I phoned Phil, talked to him, and he was like barricaded in his basement. I was kind of cool. Like, I was talking to him, and then he was halfway through. He's like, ah, screw this, man. I'm going to go upstairs. He kept talking about his 50 He had a big 50 inch TV. <laughs> he was going to watch it. And then he reminded me of all this stuff that I was there. And then the coolest one thing was he reminded me that he had taken me to a game where uh, uh, Daryl Sutter uh, had uh, played in the game. Like a junior hockey game? Yeah, <laughs> junior Moncton? hockey game. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was really, really cool. It was amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. You t you tweeted that story. You also tweeted a really touching story about Robin Williams. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What is it with Twitter and uh, the the short stories? You seem to like that form. You express yourself well in it. People like it. What is it about about well, Twitter yeah. and short stories for you? Well, because I didn't know what Twitter was for really much. You know, people told me you gotta get Twitter, and I was like, it, that, no. People just say that you know. I'm eating a hamburger, stuff like that. That's what I thought it was. Yeah, which and it a lot kind of, of it, is. Yeah. A lot of it is, yeah. And uh, so then I went on it and I told some jokes, and then my fans would go, that one sucks. They're supposed <laughs> to be your fans, you know. <laughs> they just abuse you constantly. So, uh, But then I would sometimes have uh, memories of people, or, you know, people pass or something, and I'd have a memory and hmm. uh, uh, no one to tell it to, and so it would just be late at night. And sort of, it's not really meant to as anything that would ever be published or anything. It, it mm. was just a, a way of me telling uh, the people that uh, followed me on Twitter that I knew Robin Williams, and I met Robin Williams once, and he was very sweet to me. And um, so I just, you know. Do you think people are getting a, a different side of you through those sorts of tweets and short stories? Uh, yeah, maybe. Like, you know, pe pe people, or people are always thinking, you know, uh, that you're... Uh, um, that there's only one side to you when, you know, the performing side of a person obviously is the the smallest side of yeah. uh, of their uh, of their facets, you know. But uh, um, yeah, maybe they get a little bit of. Uh, but that's not really why I do it. I just do it because it's late at night and I'm alone and I don't drink or smoke or 
do drugs or uh, be promiscuous or anything, so I just kind of reflect a lot. Well, another thing people got a sense of you from uh, Twitter is when you defended Alice Monroe. Oh, uh, yeah. A little, little attack from Brett Eden Ellis. Yes, yes. Well, there's Twitter. this guy, Brett Eden Ellis, who I don't really follow modern, I don't think you call that literature, graffiti, whatever it is he does. So he <laughs> uh, he had written something against Alice Monroe. And then uh, I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I read one, one, of, the, one of his uh, uh, quote-unquote books and uh which which one american psycho american psycho yeah. yeah that was the famous one and people had told me it was good <laughs> but whatever so then i was like how dare this guy you know to say something about something he doesn't understand you know i mean they, it's one that you can be a bad writer but god at least read <laughs> You know, at least you learn to read if you're going to be a writer, for God's sakes. Well, people so, probably and, didn't know about your interest in literature, uh, <coughs> in your no, analysis. People, and... No, people no, people don't know that. I like writing a great deal, you know? Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to me, the source. But the greatest writers are novelists. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, then I would put, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, singer-songwriters I put way, way up there. Ahead of uh, comedians. Oh yeah, yeah. Why? Well, because com- I don't think of comedy really as an art. Like uh, I think of uh, other things. I think of comedy as a, more of a craft. You know, it can reach certain levels, but only certain levels, because comedy requires laughter. And as soon as you require something <clears throat> of an audience, you're in you're in trouble. You know. To you that's interesting because to me, comedy is the highest art. Really? Because it's the most kind of simple and precise and it holds the most things together. Like in, in one joke or one sort of comedic phrase or story, you can represent so many things. And it's laughter is kind of the thing that brings the most people together. I think even more than music, people like laughter. Uh-huh. So I think it's kind of the what highest. What did you just say, though, that it holds what? It holds so many things together. You know, somebody, somebody can, can tell a joke that is true, that is funny that is sad kind of all at the same time and it can be as short as one line so to me it's actually kind of the highest art no i mean as far as writing goes like to me the shorter the better like uh like if you take comedy writing like a movie yeah. would be the worst to me and then a, a tv show and then a sketch i mean in terms of hardness and then yep. a joke would be the hardest and this shortest joke you know like uh there's a famous joke by henny youngman take my wife please so that's four word joke you know mm-hmm. three word set up and one word punchlines that's incredibly difficult um but um no the, the reason i was saying is because you because you have to produce laughter so you can't have you can have a layered joke but you can't have something that can be interpreted by different people in different ways because you have to create a noise at a certain time hmm. and that noise has to be um consistent so every single person in that audience has to understand so therefore it's, uh, it's a little bit of a blunt force instrument yeah um uh, you know but the but but there is a way to there is a way to bring art you know into comedy into comedy but it's 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 it's, it's, it's more difficult I have to say, my favorite. I, I don't. I, I'm not usually serious about stuff, so yeah, yeah. I'm not good at it. <laughs> no, that is that's that's great. I have to say, probably my favorite thing about you, and I told you I saw your show in Vancouver. Uh-huh. I pretty much paid the ticket, however much it was, to hear you say the phrase "on account of." That is like to me the funniest thing. <laughs> on account of. <laughs> on account of. It's, well, it's kind of Canadian uh, phrase, I think. <laughs> did that just strike you as funny, or is it? Did you ever analyze that? There's something about that that's just hilarious. I paid fifty dollars to hear you say that live. <laughs> on account of. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I was I grew up a uh, shad. Uh, my father was old when he had me. Yeah. And it's fifty. 50, a little over, over fifty. And then uh, I grew up in rural uh, Canada. Very barren soil and everybody was old except me and my brothers so everybody was like 50 all my dad's friends were 50 so i i i grew up with all the old guys and uh, so i i took on a lot of their phrases and stuff like that so sometimes uh, like my dad remember my dad would say she's no hell and uh it was such a weird phrase to me about uh, that meant she's nothing special you know she's not that pretty okay she's no hell well, you'd think it would be she's no heaven. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but I uh, yeah. So I I'd, I'd learn phrases like that. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, and fans also love your fearlessness on stage. On account of what? <laughs> On account of you going on, you know, talk shows, even Conan O'Brien has talked about how you're unpredictable. He never knows what you're going to do. Well, what how- happens is in talk shows, they tell you, not here, mm-hmm. but, uh, uh, you know, in Letterman and, uh, and Conan and stuff, they pre-interview you. So you tell a story to the pre-interviewer, then he tells Letterman. Then you go on and tell Letterman, he already knows the story. Yeah. So I started, when I first started, I was like, I just made up a whole bunch of stories that I didn't tell. <laughs> so I'd tell the pre-interviewer a bunch of stories. Then I'd get on Letterman, he'd ask me, and I'd tell him all different stories uh, uh, to surprise him, you know? So yeah, he wouldn't yeah. know the story, because that sucks if a guy's already heard the story. And uh, so then finally they decided, ah, what's the use, you know? But do do Letterman and says. Conan and these guys like when you throw something new at them, or do they are they like... No, they like Norm. it. Yeah, they like it. They're cool with it. Because, <clears throat> well, I mean, Letterman's the funniest guy I've ever met. So he's like, you got to keep up with him. You know, he's very, very difficult to uh, to to stay with, you know, because he's just so funny and so fast and so yeah. super sharp. And, you know, I remember one of my first things I ever did, it was this joke that I, it was in my act. It had been in my act for a year or whatever. And I did it on panel with him talking. Panel is when you just talk to the guy. And, uh. Then he did a line right after it that was funnier than all the thing. I was like, ah, damn, I worked for a year on that joke, and you just thought of it out of your crazy big mind. <laughs> did you first meet him doing stand-up, or did you first meet him on that show? No, on, uh, uh, on, on that show. He, he did stand-up for a very short time when I was a, a, a young boy, but uh, he was not a, a stand-up. But... but uh, he was nice to me. He's taking me to dinner and stuff and talked. You know, he's kind of an odd duck, but uh, uh, super smart and uh, really, really funny. But you can be having dinner with Letterman. It'd be like six. You know, he always brings five or six guys, so he's protected. And then he'll be like, I got to go to the bathroom. And then uh, he's he leaves. <laughs> and then people, you go, I guess he's not coming back. <laughs> Does it ever scare you, the chaos? The chaos of? Of being unpredictable of sharing some story that you know, hasn't been vetted yeah, by everyone sometimes else. Sometimes I do, do get scared. I get scared on the Howard Stern show because it's so long form and he does this thing where he's super honest and then he makes you be super honest. And then afterwards, you're like, what did I say? What did I say? What did I say? And then I remember one time I was in a, a, a limo, like right after Stern, I was talking to a limo driver, and this Greek guy. And I was like, I was talking to Stern. I don't even know what I said. He's like, yeah, he's like, he's like a hypnotist. He goes, I bring my wife to, uh, I, bring, I don't know if this is, yeah, this is very perfect. good Greek. He goes, I bring my wife to, uh, to uh, Las Vegas one year. Hypnotist bring me up. I talk to him. I don't know what's going on. All of a sudden, I'm in my underwear. <laughs> so it's like, that's what it's like. He like looks you right in your eye, talks to you now. All of a sudden, you're in your underwear. <laughs> Sidebar, do you think that actually works, that hypnotist stuff? I I'll tell you, man, I saw Ravine the Impossibilist once, and that was the guy's name. Yeah. It was at the NAC in uh, Ottawa, where I live. I was 13 years old. And he had guys up there, and he was talking to them, and they're he said, you do And then one, so everybody running around, one guy talked like he was from the moon. He said, you were from the moon. You got moon language. And this other guy, he does this other thing. And you're a chicken and stuff, right? right? So it's all chaos going around. And that guy pecking, I remember the chicken guy went right by me. He was pecking, trying to get some food. <laughs> There's no food. And anyways, after the show, I was out in the parking lot with my brothers, right? And I see the guy. I go, there's that chicken guy. I'm going to talk to him. So I went up to him. I said, what was that light, man? You thought you were chicken. And then he's like, it was cool. And I was like, wait a second. Hold on. Like, if you... Thought you were a chicken for 15 minutes. If you had that psychic break, you go like you go like, oh my god, I gotta go lie down and seek counseling. And you know, and so the guy was just going along, just lying. He's like, it's cool. How's that cool? <laughs> Thinking you're not even a human. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I don't believe it. Yeah. I was they want me to uh stop smoking. Say go to a hypnotist and they'll you know, he said it worked for me. I'm like, I don't I feel I want to quit myself on account of <laughs> I don't want to be that weak that a hypnotist, you know, I go, Hey man, I quit smoking. That's the good news. Bad news, I got no will of my own. <laughs> it's a <like> old man uh <laughs> on Bloor Street. <laughs> he makes my decisions for me.
um, okay, just going back to the the, the chaos for a second, and yeah. uh, sorry, I have to catch my breath. Uh, yeah, going back to the to the chaos for a second. Is there anything in those moments that comes to mind that you've regretted, like? Oh, I shouldn't have taken that turn. That really, really stands out for you. I shouldn't have said that, or I shouldn't have made that joke. Um, no, not usually, because I like I bomb many, 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 many times. And uh, when I do, I have a sort of outer body experience. Because there's a thing with stamps when you see another guy bomb, you're like, ah, you like it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is, but you're used to seeing people do good. And if you know people have stories, even in life, usually the stories something bad happened to you. If you're yeah. all your stories, you're the hero. That's not a good story. No, no. <laughs> you know. And then I did good again. You know. So uh, usually the <laughs> usually the stories are you're embarrassed, something bad happened like that. So uh, I get a kind of an outer body experience while I'm bombing. Because I think it's kind of funny. Like, guys went there to laugh, and then nothing worked out. And then also it's funny they hate your guts. Like, you're doing your best. It's not like you're intentionally, you know, trying to make them not laugh. Yeah. But you're just failing. And then they're like, we hate you. Like, you know, and so I find that kind of funny. Then I smirk, and then they really, really hate me. But that doesn't exist in other forms of performance. Like, if I go up and I play a song and uh -huh. people don't think it's great, there's like this instinct to clap. Yeah, right. People just clap yeah. or cheer. Yeah. They're just, just this instinctual thing that happens because the song's done. Yeah. But with comedy, it's almost the opposite. It is. They got to clap. You know, you can get people to clap. I always thought clapping for comedy was the opposite thing you want because clapping is like a, a scent sort of. They're saying, we agree with you. You know, it's usually like... Some lame thing like you go, Pat Buchanan's a Nazi or some ridiculous thing. <laughs> um, ridiculous thing. And uh, so, uh, uh, but laughter is involuntary. Yeah. You know, laughter is like people don't, don't expect or want to laugh. But uh, uh, applause is like, yes, we agree. You are right. George Bush started a war. <laughs> you know, you're like, well, where's the damn joke? <laughs> we we got to wrap up uh, unfortunately right, but you were awesome well thank you you were you were great and you, I hope you, you stay i hope you stay uh you stay here do the job that'd be awesome thank you very much i'd love yeah. to have you back if i do yeah that'd be great um last last thing you were campaigning for craig ferguson's job and um we just want to know what's next for you we we want to see more of you we want to hear more of you oh what's well that's next? a nice thing for you to say it's the truth i don't know why you're so plural why is this you what do you mean? Did they teach you that on radio? Go, we would like to see. That. No, that's uh, actually, the, I think they're trying to get me not to say that oh, oh, oh. anymore. Yeah, yeah, say I. And say I, but uh, yeah. I don't know. It's like a natural, deferential, I think, polite thing, maybe, yeah, 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 or something. Yeah, yeah. It feels too intimate to say I do. Oh, okay. So, hey, there's some music. Oh, there's sir. some music, yeah. So yeah. we got to go. Hopefully, uh, Norm will stick around. Norm MacDonald is at the Queen Elizabeth Theatre in Toronto tonight and at Hamilton Place in Hamilton, Ontario tomorrow. He joined us I in I believe the Q. Hamilton one was the last Cosby performance. True.